welcome to this Linnean Lens. Um, today, uh, our archivist Alex Milne is going to talk about describing nature aspects of the Linnean Society paper collection, uh, because she's just uh, finished, pretty much finished cataloging uh, what we call our society papers, and she'll say a little bit more about that. So Linnean Lens is an online event that we uh, put on, I think it was July last year, um, with the specific aim of bringing uh, a, an object or several objects of, the, of a similar nature uh, directly to you via Zoom, um, and we use a document viewer to kind of get close to the uh, to, to the object itself, uh, which is a little different from using PowerPoint, but we usually use both uh, technologies at the same time. Um, before I pass over to Alex, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we prefer, uh, we would prefer if all the questions could go in the Q&A box at the bottom rather than the chat, because they're easier to, easier to parse and, and look through than in the chat where you can um, put general comments. Um, and I think that's about it. So Alex will present for about uh, 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Um, Alex is our archivist. She started, she's actually our um, maternity leave archivist, and she's been here for about nine months now. She's done a tremendous amount of cataloging for us um, and has dealt with uh, you know, dealing with readers in the library, uh, working hybridly, etc. So it's been an interesting nine months for us. Um, but she's going to talk about uh, the society papers, which, uh, as I said, she's just finished cataloging. So over to you, Alex. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with PowerPoint and then show you some things. Right. I hope this works. Right, has everyone got that? <clears throat> so, in his 2021 book on the artwork of Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne, Simon Martin writes, sitting quietly behind some of our greatest cultural achievements is the observation of nature, more than simply noticing something, observation requires us to use skills of perception and to recognize the significance of the subject under scrutiny. It has been essential to the collecting and recording of data, which led to some of the most important scientific discoveries from gravity to the theory of evolution. From the very beginning of the Linnaean Society, the presentation and study of plants and animals relied upon these observations being recorded and sent to London to be read at meetings. As travel was slow and expensive, it was often difficult for those without independent means to view subjects, especially a non-native plant or animal in its natural habitat. Some relied on jobs that allowed them to travel and others contented themselves with books and correspondence, buying and collecting samples and descriptions for their personal study. Unfortunately, this often worked better for plants which could be handily pressed and posted. Animals fared a little worse. Relying on descriptions, skins and taxidermy often led to wildly inaccurate depictions. For example, the bird of paradise in the top corner pictured with no wings, as the locals prepared the specimens, often removing the plain wings to display the plumage more dramatically. This led to unrealistic representations of a miracle bird in flight, despite no obvious way of flying, and even led to their name as they were rumoured to be birds that no longer needed wings for foraging or evading predators as they lived in paradise. But before the popularization of scientific societies, scientists have very few ways to share observations widely for study and peer review. The friendships and professional connections societies such as the Linnaean afforded, as well as the extensive relevant library collections for research, brought a fast relative to the times and involved way of distributing work to the wider scientific community in the form of the published transactions. The first copy of the Linnaean Society Transactions was published in 1790 and paid for by Joseph Banks. The first paper included in the transactions was an introductory discourse on the rise and progress of natural history by our founder and then president, James Edward Smith, which includes his hopes for the society. Yet how till now could such nondescripts have been made public? 
Large works in natural history are expensive and are of hazardous sale. Few private people can undertake them, nor has there been hitherto any society to which detached descriptions could be communicated. Such an institution, therefore, as ours, is absolutely necessary to prevent all the pains and expense of collectors, all the experience of cultivators, all the remarks of real observers from being left to the world. The slightest piece of information which may tend to the advancement of the science we should thankfully receive, however trifling in itself, yet combined with other facts, it may become important. So while the library continued to grow with published works of natural science, the growing number of fellows began to send papers, notes and drawings to the society to be read at general meetings for peer review and hopefully make it into the published transactions. The majority of papers comprise of lecture notes, letters, artworks and drafts, but some include extra notes and referees reports. The Society continues to preserve this collection known as the Society Papers, which includes over 1,300 papers on a wide variety of subjects. As there are so many, this talk will focus on just a few of the newly catalogued papers and artworks that typify aspects of the collection as a whole. As many of these fellows were employed as physicians and surgeons for the East India Company or were hunting for plants and animals unknown to the Western world, many of the papers travelled across the globe to reach the society. Authors also relied heavily on the largely undocumented hard work of local and indigenous guides and artists whose knowledge and talent were invaluable to the naturalists who relied on them. This has also led to many artworks in the collection showcasing a mix of local and European techniques in portraying the plants and animals. One of these naturalists was Major General Thomas Hardwick, for whom we have 23 society papers on the animals he came across while working as a physician for the British East India Company. Many of these papers came with beautiful artworks painted by an unknown Indian artist such as the Red Panda, which can be found in our book L50, possibly the first description and painting of one ever to reach Europe. It's currently on display in the library, which is why I'm showing you a photograph. The panda paper was sent to the Linnaean in January 1821, however, it was not read immediately, and by the time it was, the French zoologist Cuvier had already identified and named it. This incident highlights the importance of the society papers to the men and women who contributed to them. The introduction of a new species was a source of information, but also a vehicle for prestige and scientific recognition in your field. Hardwick didn't stop at introducing animal descriptions, however. In a letter to James Edward Smith in 1819, he wrote, I rejoice to find you had one plant from the rhododendron seed I sent you. I should be quite vain of gaining the credit of introducing the first of the Indian species into England. I'm not sure my mother would agree. Despite not receiving the credit he had hoped for the Red Panda, the artwork he commissioned is a beautiful piece, and I am especially fond of the fluffy paw details at the top. These papers and artworks may have been intended for study, but they are often beautiful to look at and fascinating to read. Hardwick himself later noted in a letter to Smith that the transactions are highly prized in my little library. The Linnaean in particular often delights me in hours of leisure. And at this point, I'm going to switch to our viewer because we have our office copy of the first transactions, which is looking a little bit worse for wear, um, but includes the list of members at the time and a list of papers and we'll eventually go on to Mr Smith's introductory discourse and we have well pretty much all of these in the library um not all of them in such bad condition and they can be compared to the original papers because sometimes they um were published differently to how the original paper was set out. Um, the first actual paper is three letters from Thomas Hardwick.
The panned paper was not the last dealing Hardwick had with Cuvier, as he later sent several letters to the Society relating to another danger of the desperate struggle for recognised publication. Hardwick believed that a description of the four-horned antelope that he had presented to the Society in 1822, along with several pictures, had been plagiarised. A description of the antelope appeared in a French zoological publication edited by Cuvier. Um, and Hardwick believed that his description had been sent to the publication by a French naturalist he had associated with in India. As far as I know, the argument was never quite settled, but it does illustrate the tension surrounding the, public, the publishing that most scientific writers and institutions still face today, with so much professional respect tied to papers and works that one has contributed to. So this is the series of letters that Hardwick sent complaining of the plagiarised paper, although we don't hold the paper that he believed had been plagiarised, we do have the pictures that he sent, including this of the four-horned antelope. Which I'm wondering if I can maybe... Some of the artists who work with members of the society were women who, despite being accomplished um, in the sciences in their own right, were not allowed to become fellows until 1904, and before this could only submit papers if they were recommended by a fellow. Try and zoom in a bit on this because the detail is very small. Hopefully that looks slightly better. <laughs> uh, one of the ways in which they could contribute was through their artwork. In the society papers, she worked on self-taught artist Eliza Dorville, illustrated tiny marine creatures described by a fellow of the Linnaean Society and her lover, the naturalist George Montague. Her detailed works are scientific and beautiful depictions of alien creatures that enlivened Montague's descriptions. These particular pieces related to descriptions of five British species of the genus Terabella of Lynn, a genus of bristle worm. I'm particularly fond of this tiny red one because when you zoom in, not so much on the viewer, but in real life, he looks strangely happy. to drop them off the side. Uh, so next. There we go. Right. While art was a great way to add colour to a paper, some fellows took the view that it still wasn't quite enough. And as such, we have several items in the collection that include pressed petals or seed pods attached. These may once have been vibrant and soft, but they have since dried and are almost all brown and fragile now. They present an extra risk for our conservation efforts, but we want the organic material to stay with the original pieces and need them to stay stable in storage. Our conservator and her volunteer have been doing amazing work repairing and rehousing all of the artworks, so hopefully they'll last for a long time yet. This piece from JP Will's paper, Notes on a Species of Disperus, found um, on the Kagerberg in South Africa, illustrates how many of the plant diagrams are set out. We are given a wide view of the plant, especially in flower, sometimes in more than one colour to illustrate a range. We can also see the breakdown of a flower, some seed pods, some sections of leaf or fruits. Many of them are vibrant and detailed, but there are more simple artworks too, of brambles and palms. One artwork even shows a group of the native population setting up camp among the roots of a ginormous tree. The plant artworks are where we find the most detail in some way, while the animal artworks are often grand wide shots of the bird or mammal in question, sometimes posing in its natural habitat. The plants are often magnified in size to pick out the tiny detail in petal colour or number of stamen. They are as precious as they are precise. So here you can see just these bits along here 
aren't drawn there are actually petals that have been pressed if i can try and really zoom in on them you can see the discoloration of the paper where they have dried I guess this one first. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> plants and animals aren't the only descriptions that were sent to the Linnaean. SP32 by Joseph Arnold shows the area surrounding a volcano on the island of Java. The paper was read on the 17th of December 1816 and comprises of a descriptive tour of the journey to the crater of the volcano. Arnold states in the paper, it would be difficult to give such a description of this tremendous scene as it would, as would enable the reader to form an accurate idea of its terrific grandeur. So he provides us instead with visual aids to aid his dramatic account. And when you little expect it, you find yourself on the brink of the hot crater and have at your feet one of the most tremendous scenes the world can produce. This crater seems to be about two miles in circumference and is much higher on the south side, where are several strata of vegetable mould. The sides of it on the south and east are nearly perpendicular, but on the north and west are more sloping. There is a path along the edge of the crater along which you proceed to the northwest side of it, where you find a place not very difficult to descend, which leads to a deep channel down which, in the rainy seasons, torrents of water pass into the lake. Passing down this ravine, you soon find yourself at the very bottom of the crater and about 50 yards from the lake, which boils at the centre of it. While well, beautiful, the artworks did more than simply animate the words of the naturalists. The primary purpose was to recreate the conditions of the observation, acting as evidence of their findings for peer review. Arnold explains, the view I have given is of this crater is from the place where it first breaks upon the view at the top of the mound about 200 feet from the surface of the lake. The dark rocks in the foreground covered with bushes are composed of lava and other ejectments from the volcano and from the natural mound that separates the two craters. The only place that is practical to descend is on the right hand side opposite the figures that are seen on the margin of the lake. In this, he marries a specific artwork to his observations of rock composition. Some of the society paper drawings are more notably scientific with numbers and letters corresponding to comments in the paper they accompanied. Some are littered with notations for the author of, from the author of the paper. For example, in this one, SP 1033, John Short discussed an incredibly serious subject for those among you who, like me, are partial to a flat white. A brief account of the chief enemies destructive to the coffee plant. This paper came with a beautifully painted illustration of various elements of the paper. I think my personal favorite is down here. Note, where is it? It's 22A in the center here, which just states a weevil at work. And there's a tiny weevil munching his way up the leaf stem. Uh, what I find fascinating about this artwork in particular is that while most papers relating to animals and plants are about a singular species, this paper um, includes various subjects, including weevils, moths, beetles, and a cricket in various states, and the effects that they have on the plant with comprehensive labeling and notes, almost like a modern school textbook. 
today these papers are used by researchers for a variety of reasons. And I'm going to switch back to Sorry, I'm going to turn the light off. Ooh. Yeah, they are windows into the study of nature through the years. They can be used to trace the movements of family members or the work of women and the indigenous populations. The work of this is in the work of the society they can help keep track of the morphology and habitat of the subjects and considering this high research value when the society papers were listed on our catalogue they were given an original place as part of the library this means that it made sense to catalogue them by author and to remove the large drawings to make production and reading simpler however this led to many papers being separated from integral parts of their original form to reflect their place in the society's history more accurately, we've been recataloguing the papers as part of the archive and marrying them up to original drawings if they were held as part of the collection still. This has been mostly successful, though it has led to some interesting games of guess the bird and is this a description of a deer? No, it's a panda. Amusements that I realise some of the fellows that we've been researching for this project would have found the humour in after finding the final paper I want to show you today. Sadly, it's printed on delicate tissue paper, um, and as such, we'll be relying on photographs rather than showing them on the viewer. It's called Fossils of the Trap Formation, communicated by Professor Liebig of the members of the Walkerian Institute. This paper details some extraordinary fossils the writer discovered that shone a light on hitherto uncultivated branches of natural history. He fully describes the various fossilized findings and includes rough sketches of the probable appearance of the creatures he's found. Curious creatures <laughs> who hibernated through the summer, ran on both four legs and two legs, depended on how it is reared, and prove a link between the fish and fowl family. So I present to you the alligator, the crocodile, and the cock salmon. I presume that the date this paper was read at the Society may have something to do with its content, as it was read on the 1st of April, 1883. But these imaginative creations weren't the crowning glory of this paper to me, which ends... Probably, however, the most extraordinary discovery of all was the finding close to the surface of the ground of a species of perch in perfect preservation, with the slightest symptoms of decay being visible, though it must have been lying there for untold ages. Incredible as it may appear, this perch on careful measurement was found to be no less than five and a half yards long, the length, in fact, of an ordinary rod. The weight, unfortunately, was inestimable, as there were no scales. I'm going to have to assume that you all found that really, really funny, because unfortunately, Zoom doesn't allow me to hear you, but I cackled for an obscene amount of time after I finally managed to transcribe it. Before I go, I'd like to apologise for the animal focus of many of these pictures. I'm afraid I've been home thanks, for COVID, uh, thanks to COVID a lot, so these are just a few of the pictures I've shared with my family and friends while cataloguing the artwork. So you can spot the one that I turned into a birthday message to my brother. I promise there are plenty of beautiful plants included in the collection too. Anyway, thank you for listening to this Linnaean Lens Talk. There are so many amazing papers and artworks that it was impossible to fit them all in, but I hope I've done the collection justice. If you have any questions, I'm sure we'll do our best to answer them between us, or please feel free to email the library. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, that's great. Thank you. Um, if you can put your camera on. Oh, there you are. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to put in the chat as well the link to the catalogue. Um, I'm not sure you'll find all of the Society papers there yet because our catalogue is updated twice a year. So while it's now uh, pretty much catalogued on the back end, it'll still need to, uh, to be updated by um, Calm or Axial who, who manage our catalogue. But there's a good chunk of them uh, there and as uh, Alex says, if uh, if you are interested, and you know that uh, a fellow has presented or presented papers to be read to the society, there's a good chance we may have its manuscript. Unfortunately, our probably our most famous um, 
uh, paper read at the society, that of Darwin and Wallace, we do not have the manuscript, which is a, a great shame. So um, if you have any questions, either type it in the Q&A or you can also, I believe you can raise your hand and Padma, our events manager, who's in the background, can unmute you and get you to ask your question live. So please don't hesitate. Oh, I see there's a question. Um, so lovely presentation, Alex. The no nonsense animals reminded me of Edward Lear. Do you think there was a larger tradition of creating such creatures amongst the past FLS? I, I mean, I wouldn't be able to specifically answer them. I would say that one of the things you do notice from a lot of these papers is they do have a sense of humour. And it's a very specific sense of humour that is often quite kind of tied into what it is they're interested in. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if there were more sort of jokey papers in the past. The problem is that the reason that paper is on tissue paper, I think, is that they weren't expecting to keep it. They probably thought this is going to be a funny joke and then I'm not going to waste nice paper on it. Um, so the likelihood is we don't have them anymore if they were jokes. I'm not sure how that one survived. Um, I'm very glad it did, but it might just have been someone like me who thought it was too funny to let go of. We do keep a lot of things at the Linnean <laughs> Society. So. Um, I was I was just wondering whether, because we have also in the background, Will Harrell, our librarian, who's done a little bit of work on Edward Lear or, well, who know, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. The only thing that came to my mind there is that there's quite a long tradition of um, the Linnaean society we're taxonomists basically and so going right back to Linnaeus you have the the paradoxa in his Systema Naturae which is full of weird and wonderful mythological beasts and um, I wonder if that might uh, lie at the heart of some of these nonsense animals the idea of a what they call a waste bin taxon you know this sort of this group where you put um, creatures that possibly don't fit into other categories um, and whether there's a bit of a play on Linnaeus's own history there but um, I'm not sure about Lear specifically um, there seems to be quite a, a distinct line in Lear's career between his his nonsense and his scientific work and the two don't seem to bleed into each other too much but um, you never know we may find the manuscript that links both <laughs> um, thank you there's another question um, do you have a digital archive of these society papers that can be accessed? No, I'd love to say that we do, um, but no, not at the moment. They've only they've only just been reunited with their pictures, so I think digitizing them and it's going to take a little bit longer. <laughs> um, yeah, we do have a a, a digital uh, archive. We've got online collections. Um, but you can find most of our, our core collection, I'd say, like the Linnaean uh, manuscripts, the all the specimens from Linnaean and Smith, the Smith correspondence, um, and some of the artwork from Buchanan Hamilton, um, a Scottish, also a physician who worked for the East India Company, actually, like Hardwick, um, and or I think he was a surgeon. Um, and the, the, his artwork on plants and, and a few animals is, is on there as well from Nepal, Indian, Bengal. Um, but we don't, we don't, um, I mean, it, I guess what I would say is that the society papers are, are okay to be handled. They're not fragile and they're not overly uh, subscribed, if I can say that. They'd, you know, we don't get a huge amount of requests for them. So at the moment, I don't think digitizing them would be our priority. There are other collections that probably would come as a priority. Um, do we know how many fellows would typically attend a meeting in the early days, 1788 to mid 19th century? So we kind of do. I wouldn't be able to tell you off the top of my head, but the transactions um, have lists of people who are part of the society but the minutes of meetings would often have people especially early at the beginning when everyone knew everyone else's name um, and some of the papers actually have notes as to who's read them or who's peer-reviewed them so it would be possible to kind of work back for a lot of them I think but I wouldn't know off the top of my head 
Yeah, I think it's no more than 20 or 30 really at, at a meeting. I seem to remember the the vote on um, allowing women to become fellows was extremely well attended. For an evening meeting, that's one of the best attended. I'm trying to remember what the, was it 60 or 70? There were 54 votes for, and I can't remember how many against, but a minority, thankfully. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I, I would say about between 20 and, th and 30, kind of. Yes, uh, so Andrea has just noted in the chat, and Andrea Deneau is our um, digital assets manager, she, so she's in charge of reprographics and digitization, and she maintains the online collections. And she says that, uh, she makes a good point that society papers that have been published uh, were uh, so they were either published mostly in the transactions of the Linnean Society, as Alex has shown, and these are available uh, within our journals on Oxford University Press, which I think they're supposed to be open access, but I'm not sure they actually are. So all the proceedings and transactions of the Linnean Society should be open access, but if they're not, um, then you can head to the... Um, Biodiversity Heritage Library, who has the, the published papers. Um, two more questions coming in. Uh, bringing in information about the fellows really brings the subjects to life. Are there any you've come across whose life stories have particularly interested you? Um, there's an awful lot of work going on about Hardwick at the moment, which is probably the reason we know so much about him. Um, I don't know, the, there are some by Brown, um, who was obviously quite a, what's the word, um, eminent member of the society in itself. The, the thing that I actually did find amusing was the fact that the person who submitted the most papers, if you're looking through our, kind of the ones that we have, is James Edward Smith. So you're just scrolling and it's Smith, 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 like in paper machine. Um, so I found that quite amusing. I, I think Eliza Dorville actually was one of the reasons I wanted her in there was because uh, it's so hard to find information on her that isn't married to, well, uh, ironic use of words there, to her lover um, who she lived with and did so much work for, but obviously wasn't a member of the society herself. So I found that quite interesting. I'm sure there are other people. I, I find pretty much all of them interesting, but those are the ones that kind of I can think of off the top of my head i liked i liked um the uh the platypus at the end as well that was i was quite fond of him especially as he's not actually down as a platypus he's down as a duck-billed beaver um <laughs> just an amazing amazing name thank you um chris preston says uh, is there any educate it sorry i'll start again is there any, any indication in the society papers why some papers were published and others not? I think, so not really. Um, you do occasionally find notes that come with the society papers that say um, either I support this and I've also done research on it and I think it's very interesting or I'm not entirely sure about this bit and maybe you should check it. Um, just as peer review is to this day but I think it's probably very similar to now in that you could submit whatever you wanted but whether or not people liked it enough or whether it was publishable whether you'd ha actually had enough information because some of them are incredibly short some of them are very small letters that just say I found this plant I think it's interesting um, it's purple and I've enclosed a little bit of the leaf them for you but other than that there's not much to it so they probably wouldn't have bothered publishing it so I think while there isn't any actual statement of why things were chosen and why they weren't I think it's a fairly boring answer really. I think it may be possible to to actually find potentially some of those answers using some other collections in the domestic archives so uh, it would take a while, but you could. Yeah, yeah, but you could, if you looked at some of the letters, I mm -hmm. think, that were sent to the society, might have some of that information. And also there's a register of the talks. Yeah. But I don't think that says more than just kind of rejected or accepted. Yeah. 
there's a few more questions coming in. Uh, can you give a sense of the scale of the Society Papers collection? So how many papers are there? I think you mentioned it right at the beginning, but uh, and roughly what proportion may have illustrations and other supporting materials? So I would definitely say that the vast majority, the issue that we have is that the only papers that had artworks removed were the artworks that were rather large. So anything that was A4 or smaller stayed with the paper. Um, so it would have been noted originally on the library catalog. And so we haven't really concentrated on that because it's already mentioned the kind of project was based around the idea of re patriating specific artworks. Um, I think the vast majority don't have artworks, but I would say that it's probably about at least, I would say at least 40% of them have something, whether it's a very quick sketch or a print or just a, like a very tiny um, pencil or ink sketch that's on the paper. Um, it's yeah it's over 1300 papers some of them have papers some of them are only artworks and the paper didn't survive um so it's a bit it's a real mix um yeah yeah and i suspect some of them may also have come with specimens but in this case um well, that's an interesting question, actually. I don't know, because the the, the society had ma many more specimens than just the Linnean uh, collections and the Smith Herbarium, but they were all sold at auction in 1863. So we've got the auction catalogue for all these specimens. Um, so anything that was that might have been brought to the society and left there would have been sold at auction. I suspect that a lot of the authors may have taken the specimens back with them as well. And some of the papers actually state that the author didn't want the paper back, but he took the um, artwork with him. Okay. Um, I, th I mean, whether or not they just didn't want the paper or whether they thought I'll donate the paper to the library and then I'll take the artworks for myself to show my friends. Um, but so there are a few that say they did have artworks originally or make a note of artworks. And some of the artworks were published in the transactions as well. So we know that they would have had artworks, but they aren't in our possession. So getting getting to the original material is, is a really yeah. uh, <laughs> intricate research. Um, so there's another two questions. Can you please remind us of the name of the author of the paper about coffee? Uh, I think that was Short. I think it's John Short, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, John Short. And uh, Rebecca Cassidy uh, continues. Can you say anything about? Sorry. Can you say anything more about the contrast between representing one subject and a group of subjects in one illustration? Was it was this a turning point, or just one individual who chose to represent nature this way? I think it's one individual there are a few papers that do talk about I mean those two birds from the end we were for a while looking at a paper that does discuss three different birds one of which is wildly different from the other two but they supposedly came from the same area um, so I think it was it wasn't so much like a, a turning point I think it was more that specific people had different areas of what their interest was whether it was a geographical area or a plant and as him as with him it was more about the pests of that specific plant on the whole he wasn't looking specifically at each pest it was more the effect they had on the plant um, so I think it was more the specific people's interest rather than a, a massive turning point um, and things don't I don't think there are I, I mean having not read every single one of them I wouldn't say that there is a any point within the society papers where you can see something dramatically shift they all are quite similar in the way that they discuss things it is it's very much like James Edward Smith wanted at the beginning it's any information that anyone finds interesting just sent to us and if you also find this interesting or if this helps anyone then great um, which I thought was rather lovely. Thank you, Alex. Um, 
There's one last question on there. Is there work being done to discover the identities of the anonymous local artists working in colonial era areas? I know some are known, but you would think this might be an interesting avenue of research. I mean, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, indeed. So, uh, yes, yeah, interestingly, uh, we uh, we had a researcher in last week who uh, said that uh, who kind of traced the uh, the artist for Hardwick, and it looks like it's an Englishman, actually, not not um, not anyone from India mm -hmm. um, but I, I suspect Hardwick did use Indian artists as well but this is definitely something that the collections team is very much interested in pursuing um, I don't know if you've seen uh, the uh, artwork that we I mean th in this case it's not an anonymous art art piece of art but um, the John Tiley breadfruit tree uh, that we acquired last June or July um, and uh, and we're really trying to find out more about the artists, not only the artists actually, but also the collectors uh, that were employed uh, by naturalists across the world to um, collect or depict uh, and help them transmit information and, and knowledge about the, nat the natural world. So yes, this is something that we're undertaking. We're seeking funding. Um, so I, I can't say too much about it because some of it is uh, is in funding applications, but we're definitely, uh, we've, we've got at least two projects potentially are on the go to, to find out a little bit more about collectors and, and artists with, um, within the colonial uh, areas, British Empire mostly. Um, yes, I think, I think that's it for questions. So I'm just going to give it a minute. And if there are none others while I'm waiting, uh, just to, as usual, do a little bit of promotion of our book of treasure, which came out, uh, in 2020. Oh, there you go, Padma, we're, we're in sync. <laughs> um, and this contains some of the society papers that, um, Alex has uh, talked about today and and much, much more. So it it's, contains about 50 objects, uh, specimens, artwork that are in our collections. Um, and, um, and Padma's put the link on the chat. I see there's quite a few uh, chats coming in uh, and it's about next events. So uh, thank you very much, Alex. I think there are no more questions. Thank you. There's been some lovely feedback on the chat, which hopefully we'll save and you can see it later. Um, and our next Linnean Lens will be, it's not on our website uh, now, but that's because the date is not quite fixed. It'll be either the 19th or the 26th of April. Uh, and I will be presenting on some of our um, fishes in the linen collection, so the dried pressed fishes in the linen collections, along with our honorary curator of uh, fishes and shells, Ollie Crimmen, who works at the Natural History Museum. So do join us then. There'll be more detail on the website as soon as the date is fixed. And thank you all for coming and see you soon. <laughs>